It's my privilege to wrap up our series on resilient hope. And I've called today's message, Here's Hoping. To begin with, I want to focus for a few, mon- few minutes on the word resilience. I wonder what comes to mind, what images come to mind when you think about resilience. Here's a few that uh, resonated with me. Resilience is defined as the ability to withstand adversity, to endure, to keep going, and to bounce back from difficult life events. About five years ago, I decided for some unknown reason (laughs) that I was keen, maybe not keen, that I was going to attempt to do a half marathon. Now, I've never been a runner. I I don't enjoy it. Uh, I love walking, but running, no thanks. In fact, I remember when I was in uh, Form 2 at Napier Intermediate, and we were um, training for cross-country, and all it involved was going round and round the school field like 15 times, and I hated it. And so did my best friend, Rebecca. And our school field happened to have an alleyway off the field that went out onto a street. Some of you know what's coming. This particular day, Rebecca and I were really fed up. We're like, this is ridiculous. We did a couple of laps, and then when the PE teacher wasn't looking, I know this is very hard to believe that I would do this, but it's a true story. When the PE teacher wasn't looking, we just ducked into that alley, wandered down, hung out on the street for, I don't know, probably 10 minutes, and then wandered back, made sure the teacher wasn't looking, and we jumped back in, did a final round, and that was our training done. So I've never loved running, but I decided, I guess it was one of those bucket list things. You know, you're just like, it would be really cool to say, I've done a half marathon. So I decided this was 2018, I was going to start training. And I was talking to a friend here at church about it, and he said, that's great, man, you know, good on you. Um... Now, which, which marathon are you going to do? I said, I haven't even thought about that. And he said, I reckon you should go for the Wellington Half Marathon. It's nice and flat and just goes round Oriental Parade and round like for miles and miles. And so it would be a perfect event for you for your first half marathon. I said, cool, okay, I'm going to aim for that one. So I started training. And like I said, this didn't come easily. I remember getting to my first 5K thinking, okay, this is all right, I can do it. I then got to my first 10K. And then one Saturday morning, I managed 12K. And I was so proud of myself. I got home, and it just so happened that another good friend of mine called. He said, hey, man, what's happening? And I said, Tim, you're never going to believe this. I've just run 12K. He's like, whoa, what are you doing that for? I said, well, that's a very good question but I'm I'm hoping to do a half marathon. He said, that's fantastic. I reckon what you need to do is an event before the half marathon to kind of get into event mode. I said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And so he told me about this event coming up in Wainuia Mata, and their rongarong is in about a month's time. And so I said, okay, cool, let's register. And the event was either a 12K or a 16K. And I said to him, without even looking at the event, my first big mistake, (laughs) as you'll soon see, uh, I said, well, look, I've just run 12K today. This event isn't for another month. I reckon let's go for the 16. (laughs) So we registered for the 16K. I rocked up, and I learned that the name of this event was Makero's Revenge. Now, I don't know who Makero was, But he was super mad at somebody because, I tell you, I'd never even looked. I didn't even know elevation charts like this existed. And if you look, that first little kilometre there, I was sweet. I was thinking, I've got this. And then we hit that mountain, like you can only call it a mountain. And before long, I was kind of walking and then I'd run a little bit. I wasn't the only one walking, like it was tough. Before long, we were at the back. And when I say we were at the back, I mean we were last. (laughs) There was me and Tim and the tail end Charlie 
for, and those of you that have ever done any events know that there's an official that runs around, follows the last person to make sure that they finish, I guess. It is so embarrassing. <laughs> but we eventually got up the top. We did the big loop around, and then we had to come back down the Kero's Revenge, which was just as bad, very bad on the knees. And we got to the bottom, and you can probably see, we could either head off back to the start line and just do the 12K race. And we stopped for a moment, and Tim said, what do you reckon, Mandy? We can go for the, you know, this is your first event. There is no shame in just doing the 12K. Or we can head off east and do that extra 4K loop and go for the 16. And I remember... I was going to say I looked him in the eyes, but I think it was more like Tim. <laughs> I signed up for the 16, and I'm going to do the 16 if it's the last thing I did. And it almost was. <laughs> we, did, we did it. 16K. And I remember that sense of determination that no matter what happened, I was going to hang in there, and I was going to do this. I remember getting back to Mum's place afterwards, and I sat down on the front deck to take my shoes off, and I literally couldn't get up. I actually crawled through the front door <laughs> and collapsed on the lounge floor. And I did go on to do the Wellington Half Marathon. Now, my good friend here, Brad Adamson, fortunately he's not here today, but I'm calling him out anyway, he said, I'll be there, man, you know, we've got this. And I never for a moment thought we'd be running the race together. But conveniently, a month or so beforehand, he informs me that he has to have knee surgery. And he's not going to be at the race. But I did it anyway. It was a howling southerly. It was the most miserable two hours or whatever it took me. And I had two hopes for that race. I hoped that I could finish it. And I hoped that I wouldn't be last. And I wasn't, not even for my age group was I last. I learned a lot about resilience and endurance during that time. And later on, I'll share with you the three things that kept me going, especially during that first revenge race. We all hope for different things in our lives, don't we? We hope for an end to the pandemic. Last weekend, lots of us were hoping that the black ferns could win that World Cup. We hope we'll get a pay rise, that job we've applied for. We hope that our end of year exams go well. We hope that it might be sunny for that important event coming up. We hope that the war in Ukraine might stop. And we even dare to hope for world peace. When we use the word hope in this way, it really is little more than a yearning expectation almost wishful thinking. Sometimes we choose to place our hope in different things, maybe in our career. We think as long as this is under control and all is going well, everything will be all right. Maybe it's in a relationship or our family. But what happens when we find ourselves facing something out of our control? What happens when the unthinkable happens? When everything comes crashing down around us? Maybe what happens when the thing that we'd pinned all our hopes on and we've been waiting and praying and believing for and it never comes to pass? It's usually when we're knocked down by some unexpected circumstance that the truth about us and the hope that we've been clinging to is revealed. I think there's kind of two levels of hope. There's that inner yearning that things will go well, that we'll succeed, we'll see the fulfillment of our dreams and our plans. And then there's a deeper, more authentic hope. And this morning we're gonna look at the life of an Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. He was actually known as the weeping prophet, which I know doesn't sound particularly hopeful, but he did become a man of ultimate hope. A quick little bit of scene setting. 
the Jewish people had over time let their love for God and his presence wane. They'd even started uh, worshipping Baal and other gods. God had been warning them for many years to turn from their evil ways, to return back to him. But as patience had worn thin, they had broken God's covenant, thou shalt have no other God before me, and now they would suffer the consequences. But even amidst the predictions of doom, there was a glimmer of hope. God promised that their time of exile would not last forever. He promised that his people would be restored. And Jeremiah was one of the prophets tasked with emphasizing this. And as is often the case, the people didn't want a bar of it. They didn't want to listen. And all of this is detailed in the book of Jeremiah. And following that is the book of Lamentations, which is what Dom read from. It was also written by Jeremiah. And at the time of writing, the city of Jerusalem had been under siege for almost three years. The Babylonian army surrounded the walls of Jerusalem. People were starving and life was grim. And eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army break through the walls. They destroy the temple. Many people are killed and others are taken into captivity. And the Jews felt like they'd lost everything. And the first two and a half chapters of Lamentations are pretty depressing reading. They capture Jeremiah's despair and his loss of hope. He speaks about affliction and hard labor. He speaks of walking in darkness and there being no light. He he talks of his eyes failing from all the weeping. He says he feels like he's weighed down with chains, that God is not hearing or answering his prayers, and he has no peace. In verse 18, he says, And so I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I wonder if you've ever felt that way about a situation in life. During the week, I caught a little bit of an interview with Michelle Obama, who's about to release uh, a book, and it's called The Light We Carry. And she talked about how it's really the story of her struggles over the last two or three years particularly as a result of the pandemic and the huge racial division in the US. And she said this, I struggled like a lot of people to find a sense of hope. I had doubts, fears and anxieties and very little hope. This morning I want to offer some thoughts based on the life of Jeremiah and a couple of other Old Testament characters that can help us remain steady and demonstrate resilient hope when the going gets tough. So Jeremiah has declared, my splendor is gone, all that I had hoped from the Lord. He goes on to say, I remember my affliction, my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. And then he says, yet... This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Yet, such a small and seemingly insignificant word, and yet so full of hope and promise. Jeremiah has poured his heart out, and in desperation and darkness, lamenting, aware of his loss, And in the midst of all his questioning and quizzing of why God would allow this to happen, there is something that causes hope to rise. It's often in the depths of despair that the gift of hope is given. And he goes on to write what I think are some of the most beautiful and well-known verses in the Old Testament. He says, this is why I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, 
we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You see, hope was stirred in Jeremiah as he recalled who God is, as he recalled God's great love, his faithfulness, and his goodness. And we could just stop there and dwell on those verses alone because there is enough in them, these beautiful descriptors of who God is. And this is really important Because as Jeremiah focused on who God is, he moved from wanting hope from God to experiencing hope in God. You see, he'd been wanting his hope to come from what God would do. He wanted God to end this exile, to fix everything, to restore his people. However, he chose to focus on who God was. And we see this time and time again throughout God's word. People who choose to place their hope in God rather than on what God may do. We think of Job. Many of you will know his story. He practically lost everything. In the space of hours, he lost his livestock, which was his livelihood, so he lost his wealth, he lost his children, his servants, his health, many of his friends. He was dealt blow after devastating blow. And do you know what he chose to do? This blows me away every time. In Job chapter 1, it tells us he grieves, he, he tears his robes, which is a sign of the deepest grief and lament. And then he fell to the ground and worshipped God. Blows me away every single time. But you see, Job knew that when you're on your knees in worship before God, you're totally focused on who he is, not on what he's going to do. And Job goes on to declare another hugely powerful verse in Job 13, where he says, Though he slay me, yet, yet will I put my hope in him. He said, despite everything that's happened, I will hope in him. We see another wonderful example of this in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young Israelites along with Daniel, who many of you will know about. They had been taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, and the king had ordered... Uh, some of these young Jewish men to be brought into the court to be trained for three years and then to enter the king's service. And Daniel was one of those men along with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And King Nebuchadnezzar gets full of of himself after defeating the Israelites and he has a a huge gold statue uh, created. And he declares that everybody must come and bow down and worship before the statue. And in an amazing act of resilience and faith, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego say this, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Yet, even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This is a situation where many people would have given up hope. They've been taken from their homeland, forced into captivity, into the king's service, and now their very lives are being threatened. But they chose to worship God for who he was rather than for what he might do for them. And many of you know what happened. They get thrown in that blazing furnace. And when King Nebuchadnezzar comes along to see what's happened, he sees not three men walking around, 
not a hair on their head singed. But he sees four men. And he recognizes that God is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jeremiah, Job, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think that's the last time I have to say those names, all chose to worship God for who he was rather than for what he would do for them. They were resilient in their faith. But where did they get that faith from? How did they develop a hope and belief in their God that was resilient enough to stand up to the difficult situations they faced? Here's the three, th- three key things that got me through Makero's revenge and that we also see reflected in the lives of each of these characters. Number one, resilient hope is built over a long period of time. There was no way I could have just gone out and run 10K, let alone 16, let alone 21, without putting in those hours and hours of training. And the confidence and resilience I developed as a result of enduring Makero's revenge meant that when I got to that half marathon on my own, Brad, thank you, when I got to the point when we turned around at the, the halfway point, that southerly like just hit full on. And boy, did I just want to give up. Brad would never have known. But I reminded myself, Mandy, if you've done Makero's Revenge, you can do this. And the faith that each of these men demonstrated was a result of it being built up over a long period of time, of going through trial after trial. They had a foundation that was built over many, many years of God's faithfulness. Jeremiah said, yet this I call to mind. He's remembering, that's right, God has proven himself to be a faithful God. For Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, I did have to say it again, they were committed to God, to following his ways, to living the way that they had been taught from childhood. And when they came into the king's service, it tells us, I think in chapter 1 in Daniel, that they were offered all this rich food and wine that uh, the Babylonians ate. But Daniel said, no, we're sticking to what we know to be right from the way we've been brought up. And they chose just to have water and vegetables. So this is something that they have developed over years and years. And their hope in God rested on what they had experienced from their childhood. Romans 5 verse 3 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. Point number two. Resilience is made easier in the knowledge that you're not running alone. For Makiro's revenge, I literally had Tim running. He never left my sight except maybe to go back and talk to the tail end, tail end Charlie and say, look, it's her first race. It's okay, you know. But I, I wouldn't have got through it without him because he encouraged me. For Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, there was someone literally standing in the fire with them. And their hope, imagine how they would have felt when they stepped out of that blazing furnace, knowing that God himself had delivered them in a way they never would have expected. And that's how it can be with us. The closer we walk to God through the fire, the more we see his faithfulness. And the more we experience his faithfulness, the more confident we become in his ability to get us through, whatever that might look like. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. 
Final point, resilient hope is firmly grounded in the character of God. Now, if I'd been running that first event on my own, as I said, I would probably have given up, or I certainly wouldn't have carried on to do that extra 4K loop. Even if some, even if Italian and Charlie had said, you know, come on, we can do it, I would have said, I'm like, no. But because I had a trusted friend, someone who I admired and respected, somehow that gave me added incentive to show him that I could do it, to not give up, because I trusted in his character. He seemed to believe that I could do it. And so that encouraged me to believe it too. Each of these men focused on who they knew God to be, the character of God. Jeremiah, remember, he reminds himself of God's love, faithfulness, and goodness. Job knew God so intimately that he knew God was the only one that could get him through. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were convinced that God was able because they were convinced he was a good God, no matter what happened. In order to have a resilient hope that stands strong in the tough times, we must know God's character, that he's a good father who loves his children and does what is best. I want to finish with one final thought, this time from Zechariah. Another Old Testament prophet. No, not yet, Joel. (laughs) Come back. (laughs) Maybe there's another final thought. (laughs) The second to last point from Zechariah. He was another Old Testament prophet. I've always wanted to go there to be able to say that. No, not yet. Robert did that to me one time, so I'm just, you know, returning the favour. Zechariah, like Jeremiah... Uh, was around at the same time. And he also prophesied hope for the future of the children of Israel while they were in captivity. And in Zechariah 9.12, there's this beautiful verse, which I've always loved, but I don't think I ever really understood it. He says, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. And today I declare I will restore double to you. Now, prisoners of hope, It's an interesting picture, isn't it? We know prisoners are usually locked up in some high security institution and stripped of their freedoms. But being a prisoner of hope in God is quite different. 